You learn the rules. Uh, it's all up to you. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, today I'm with Richard Rice, a cartoonist who's got an expertise in this field. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of pick his brain a little bit and see what we can do about getting you on the right track if you want to pursue some cartooning. And it's, it's, it's nice to well, nice make a friend. How did you get your start with uh, cartooning? Well, as a kid, I always loved drawing and uh Whenever I had a pencil or paper or crayons or whatever, I just liked to draw a lot. And uh, I did cartoons in high school for the school paper and a few in college. And that sort of got me started. But uh, I wasn't a real good student, actually, because in my uh, notes, I'd always draw cartoons along the edges and the sides. And if, if the professor was boring, I'd do doodles and cartoons. And... Even after I became a teacher in college, there were a lot of boring meetings, and uh, I had the opportunity to draw then. So I was constantly was drawing uh, my whole life. And uh, in 1975, I had some graduate school bills, so I decided to try to uh, break into the national markets. And uh, the old Saturday Evening Post was my first sale. And uh, after that, I sold fairly often in the 80s and 90s uh, when there were a lot of uh, print uh, media, um, the uh, New York Times travel section. The Chronicle of Higher Education was my biggest market, but that's a specialized newspaper that goes to all uh, university departments around the country. And uh, I, since I was in teaching at the university, I had a lot of good gags that related to teaching and philosophy and meetings and salary, all that kind of stuff. I had been selling previously the to the Wall Street Journal, and so they picked me up uh, since then. I've sold quite a few cartoons to them. But basically, I just do it because uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy the drawing and doodling. Uh, my idea of, of, of solitary confinement in a room without a paper and pencil would be kind of the worst kind of torture. So I still doodle and draw all the time. It's some kind of internal uh, desire, I guess, uh, to do that. So... Uh, you know, I just always told my students uh, to follow their muse. And uh, actually, when I was at university, my specialty was Asian history. Uh, but I had an opportunity over the years to teach a couple seminars in cartoon history. And that was a lot of fun. You know, it started back in the 18th century and, and all that. But it turned out when we got to anime and manga, my students knew a lot more than I did because um, I was sort of a golden age cartoon uh fan, uh, the old Mad Magazine in those uh, eras, but uh, we had a lot of fun in that course. Uh, uh, the teacher, the students taught me the more contemporary and modern cartooning, and I, I think I helped them a lot, too. They enjoyed having a professor who actually did what he was teaching. Uh, one of them said that, anyway. How would you advise someone, you know, somebody wants to start submitting to the Wall Street Journal, or wants to try to get their, their things out there. How would you encourage them, or what would you encourage them to do to get that first step toward that? Well, it's, uh, I, I'll have to be honest about this. Uh, it's very hard to get into print these days. I think more difficult one than when I started, uh, because there's so many specialty magazines, and they usually don't use cartoons, so most of them don't. Um, a lot of car younger cartoonists, I notice, are going online, and you know, they know more, a lot more about that than, than I have. I've never figured out how to monetize that, but at least you can get your work out there. Um, if you belong to a church, uh, if you're still in a school or things like that, you might work with the editors of those magazines, see if you can get seen uh, that way. I, I had a, even in high school, I got, had some commercial work when uh, one of my... Uh, uh, fellow students, his dad ran a big coffee company in the Pacific Northwest, and they had a calendar. They needed uh, some replacements, uh, a couple of months uh, that they had cartoons in. Uh, they didn't like, uh, so that was when I first got paid for a cartoon, and that's an eye-opener, but just any 
thing like that, uh, newsletters and, and that sort of thing to get your work out there and to practice. What are the basic tools that you would encourage a young person to have? Uh, if they wanted to do this style of cartooning, you know, like, the, uh, do you have a specific type of pencil, a specific type of pen, a, you know, like your your basic tools? Uh, yes, indeed. I should speak better to that. Uh, I would tell anybody that wants to be a cartoonist to buy a ream, a 500-page uh, ream of paper. This is one I bought back in the 1960s. You can see from the price tag on here, 99 cents is marked down. Uh and here's an actual typewriter, if you can see that on a, a photo. They didn't use word processors and things like that in those days. Uh, but I would say buy 500, uh, get good quality paper. Uh, I use 32-pound uh, uh, typing, just regular typing paper. It's very smooth. It's so fun to work with uh, compared to the, 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 the normal papers, a little bit less weight. Um, but anyway, uh, I would just do 500 cartoons, you know, just do one or two a day, set yourself a kind of goal. I try to do one a day. I'm 30 behind right now. It, that seems like a doable goal, but other things come up. So um, uh, just do that because I look back at my earlier cartoons and they're really bad. I can see why publications didn't buy them. It took me a long time to get the right style and to, to have practice. So that may seem a little excessive, but I have almost 3,000 cartoons. Now, I number them each time. You, you, in the old days, you numbered and put your address in the back, but thank God you can submit them electronically now. So once you draw them, you can scan them and put them in storage, but keep a keep an inventory, keep a track, but you'll see your work will improve uh, over the years. So basically, you kind of, uh, uh, I just use regular pens. Or I would recommend archival quality pens, the Micron uh, pigment micron pens that have a whole range and I've had to adapt my own style to uh, uh, just line drawings. I used to use shading with markers because that's faster than using watercolor and paint and uh, you get a number five and number eight very consistent but I'm, I'm now I'm uh, working for the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Here's a rough I haven't erased the lines yet but I use a, a, a pigment uh, number, what is this one, number 12 now, which is very thick line because they reduce the, uh, they reduce the, uh, it's funny. Gosh, I had two cartoons, so I guess I'm reusing the paper. I just noticed I had another drawing on the other side. Anyway, uh, I use number eight for the captions, but eight doesn't show up for the Wall Street Journal. I use a thicker line. So there's a case, it depends who you uh, draw for uh, in the reproduction process. You might want to adapt your style to uh, what's what's needed. I really preferred my old style with shading uh, using half tone uh, and use a thicker one. And then once I uh, once I do a drawing like this, I erase it and then I'll go in and uh, uh, use a thicker brush to do certain highlights. Like this woman's pants would probably be black, the hair. You always want to draw attention to whoever's speaking. And uh, so usually the person speaking, whether a man or a woman or a dog, will be darker than the other uh, the other parts of the painting. Also, I discovered this a few years ago, uh, instead of whiteout, which doesn't work very well, there's a set of pens, and this one's made by what company? Uh, Signo, I guess it is. Uh, but it's very good white ink, so instead of redrawing a whole uh, drawing, if there's just a minor error, uh, I can white it out with this thing and redraw. If it's a lot, I just redraw again, uh, it's because it'd be too messy. But that's basically, the tools are really simple, just good quality typing paper, again, 32 weight, it's a nice thick uh, paper, and uh, they have this generally at um, Staples uh, stores around, and I would use the, uh, most art supply places have these uh, Pigma uh, pens, I think they're made in Japan, but they make a uh, uh, number eight, uh, they have a five, which for the what I'm paint, doing now for the Wall Street Journal is too thin, and they have this 12, and once in a while, uh, there's a brush, too, for doing dark areas. And a final one, Graphic 1. They have two pens called Graphic 1 and Graphic 2, which are almost like a marker pen, so I don't use them very much. They're very, very uh, bold. Um, but th those are the pens I use, and uh, an eraser and a brush, so your cost of setting up work is a lot cheaper than oil painting or watercolor or anything like that. 
um, just paper and some good quality pens uh, and eraser and, and your imagination and uh, your inner desire to keep drawing whatever it is is I think but what all you need really yes I did it nice work Listen to us. We've turned this into like an art podcast now, courtesy of Mr. Burger's questions. Maybe he's yeah, an art but... teacher somewhere. Yeah.